think I had the idea about photography initially not being enough, but I had this feeling that when I had experiences that were very rich, there was a strong element missing. So from the very first work, when you see 44 Irving Street, I don't feel comfortable with the power of the camera. And I, I think now, you know, how many young people just make photographs everywhere completely freely. And I was filled with doubt and unsureness and, you know, how does this photograph render someone? What is it? How do they feel about being in a photograph? So these questions are very long standing and evolving. So I think it moves t more towards not just the act of making a photograph, but the object of the f as a photograph. What is it? And how is it different than for us, those of us who make them, those of us who are in them, those of who see them? So this, this relationship or triangle is, and in the center is the object. So I think actually the object is the key experience, the making of the object, being in an object or looking at an object. And so all the work actually revolves around those questions. Well, I think not being comfortable making a subject into an object is where the show begins. And in a way the show ends, I'm not able to photograph the subjects. So I create, a, a, I document the space as if with their absence, but I, but I think that, no, I mean the physical thing that you make. And of course it's not very physical anymore, it's digital, so that changes so much. There's so many different ways that people do naturally participate, first in the act of the reception. I don't work very well if I don't feel welcome someplace. Um, so that's, that's a very important first part of participation. And then the participation be can begin in the case of 44 Irving Street. This, the people who are my neighbors who I didn't know respond by telling me what they think the photograph represents to them or portrays of them or misses about them, etc. In the first room you also have Frankie who speaks about the Prince Street girls many years later, maybe 20 years later, than the photographs are made, thinking about the little girls that are in the photographs that were his friends and his family who have moved out of the neighborhood. And so it's his reflection of what's happened to them and what's happened to the neighborhood. So that's a different kind of participation, more in reflection. The participation in, in Kurdistan is the act of creating a collective testimony. So it's going house to house, village to village, finding bits and pieces in archives and, and personal family collections um, that brings together almost 100 years of Kurdish history, everyone having a fragment. So very different kinds, but you find the answer. I mean, last weekend we did a workshop at the Kurdish Institute of Paris. Ten people volunteered to come in and share a small story of their life around a set of pictures that they had. So that's another form, very active, and that is just revolving. You just find it, you find the answer. It's not a strategy. If you find the response that feels appropriate to the different situations. Well, it was a completely different world. I'd never worked inside the media, so I had no idea what would happen even to the photographs that I made. I had just joined Magnum a little before that, and so Magnum had a large network. So participating in a new kind of community, a new set of relations, let's say, um, I think the more important participation in, in, um, comes later with Nicaragua. Uh, and I would say that reframing history is, is another stage where I bring back photographs from the book originally on the, to place them in the places where they were first taken. And then again, it's a kind of new reflection 25 years later about the history of that period. And the people in those photographs are not the participants necessarily. It's the people who pass by the sites and remember that time.
So I think, you know, finding, I wouldn't have known when I began my first trip in June 78 that I would be as involved 25 or more years later. You know, when you go, you have no idea how long you'll even stay. So it evolves. The word photojournalist for me is too, too aligned with um, a service for a particular purpose. And I, I guess I'm, I align a little bit more with the photo reportage tradition of France because it was very strong here in the period of the 70s into the 80s. So the observation in the world is really what I, where I cross that path, I would say. But the difference is I didn't think I was making photographs for magazines, I was making photographs for history. And I had a very strong sense that I had to stay as long as I could as events evolved, unfolded, and capture what I could. I think when you ask about fear, I had no idea that there would be a war. I didn't go because there was a war. And um, of course I felt fear of, uh, you know, and you sometimes best to go towards your fear, to conquer your own fears. I think I had much more fear in Salvador than Nicaragua. Salvador was brutal in that period. Of course it's difficult to find that balance between being open and responding honestly to what you see, what you feel, um, and of course, I think if you look back at all the reporting that was done through the insurrectional period of Nicaragua, 78 to 79, most of the press was very moved by what they saw. And the dictatorship, the 50 years of the family control, you know, that's, that, you know, there, was very, there were very few who defended Somoza in that period. I think the next period of Nicaraguan history is more complex in terms of how we saw what, what was happening. But in that period, it was very powerful to see ordinary people in the streets with whatever they had, a pistol, a machete, defending their future, you know, or creating what they thought was creating their future. You know, the time frame, I do the work from June 78 to July 79. I go back to New York and begin to assemble what I think should be a book. Um, you know, I think because I had done carnival strippers before, the book form was something that was my natural narrative form, no matter what had been published. And I saw very little at the time of what had been published. Magnum gave me a big stack at the end, which is what helps to motivate, after I've made the book, the mediations. Mediations as, a, as an installation I do in 82. Uh, in a very small experimental gallery in uh, Newcastle in the UK. So that is more a reflection of, wow, something I had no idea about is just all the different ways these photographs were used, why they selected whichever. Something that I didn't experience in the time of their making because it was so dispersed. I mean, you have to remember it wasn't digital. We didn't have the internet. We never saw what was published around the world. And when, as I did, I began to think about this object having so many different kinds of lives, which ultimately leads to the installation of the life of an image of the Molotov man, who has a very long history of 30 years representing that moment, in fact. In 91, 92, um, I was invited to San Francisco to work with a number of other artists to really try and give visibility to the issue of domestic violence. I don't know about France, but in New York, where I lived, I knew very little. I go to San Francisco, my natural inclination, coming out of the 80s, working in reportage, was to work with the police. And I followed the police into a number of situations, sometimes violence in more public settings, in hotels, mostly in homes, and began to realize how little I knew. I then started to read the documentation that they had on these various cases and then discovered that the police were making photographs that were very much like my photographs, very evidential, 
which comes also out of the language of human rights documenting abuse in Central America. So I start to see the police doing something that, in fact, I thought I was going to do. Well, what's the point of my doing it? And began to make these collages. And really, I would have done much more of that work, but I was drawn to Kurdistan just on the cusp of that body of work. So we, I, we did this one bus shelter poster. It announced a crisis line. Then there was an opportunity to go to the UK two years ago with a group called Multistory, which is a small arts organization. And they invite you to the region to respond to whatever you see or find interesting. And I, uh, after I read a bit, I realized that domestic violence was then, much many years later, decades later really, very present and wanted to understand what kind of structures had been placed, put in place and the refuge just seemed like the right place to be based, to begin to meet the women and find a way to, to include their voices, which became collage again. So it's funny, I hadn't thought about that till just now, that the collage that I made of the police records and then the collages they made cutting up magazines and trying to portray their lives have a kind of resonance. I mean, Magnum definitely shaped that whole period of the late 70s into the 80s, and certainly in many more ways than the obvious one is that it was a community. Uh, I, we work very differently. Between Kappa and Cartier-Bresson, there's a whole spectrum of ways that Magnum photographers work. They're very independent. That independent spirit is really essential. So Magnum was never a place that sent you someplace, but they're their work was to try to make the work, create an opportunity for the work to live, and magazines for the most part, but also exhibitions, many exhibitions. So the language that I shared in Magnum was bookmaking, and um, and today I still feel there are, there are people I've known and those who are no longer with us still feel very close. My my. Uh, be it Martin Franck, uh, of course I knew only two of the founders of Magnum, Cartier-Bresson and George Roger. And now I'm that generation with generations coming behind, it's a very special kind of linking, very subtle. It's a, you know, an extended family. You know some cousins and some aunts and uncles better than others, but it's still a very core community for me. The message of my teaching is to be curious, to let yourself engage, to explore the world, and through photography it's a gift, it's, a, it's an extraordinary opportunity. I hope I inspired that in the ten-year-olds as well as the master's students, and including not practitioners, but those who write critical theory and writing from a different place think about photography, to actually explore and expose themselves in the process of making photographs, which is a very different process. It's easier to look at objects and comment about them compositionally, but making them is when the real, the deeper contradictions, which I think are part of the base of all the work that you're seeing, the, the questioning which comes.